Thank you for joining us for this session, Calling All Collaborators, Finding and Sharing Free Learning Resources. Now I'm going to turn it over to FLC's Executive Director, Greg Smith, to welcome and introduce our presenter. Okay, thank you, Aisa. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today, uh, Jeff Gomez. Uh, Jeff and I were connected by a mutual friend and colleague, oh, maybe about a year and a half ago, um, and it quickly became apparent that we had a lot of mutual interests, um, both organizations very interested in sharing um, free resources, uh, open ed education resources and, and other good tools um, through his outstanding organization uh, called Crowded Learning. And at that time, I shared with Jeff that we had a, a relatively new tool available that uh, sourced uh, Khan Academy videos and, and put them into sort of a, a tool an online tool uh, to help students study for the GED. And, um, and from that initial conversation, uh, Jeff uh, approached us and said, well, what would you think about doing an app uh, that basically was sort of a, a version of what, um, what you already have online, knowing that a lot of our students uh, don't have computers and tablets at home. And, uh, and using this uh, tool called uh, Collide, to do that. And so uh, I thought that was a phenomenal idea and that resulted in a, in a partnership um, that culminated um, about a month ago with the launching of the app. And I know um, Jeff's gonna talk a little bit more about that uh, later, but it, it was a, a true pleasure to work with him and Crowded Learning. They're doing some phenomenal work. Uh, our app is, uh, our mutual app is just a, a one small piece of uh, a lot of great stuff that uh, he has. Um, uh, available through Crowded Learning, and it's just a tremendous resource, especially at a time like this when online resources are, are needed more than more than ever. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Jeff, um, to, uh, for the presentation. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Greg, uh, and, and thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, as Greg said, uh, Florida Literacy Coalition and Cotted Learning just recently completed a project that resulted in a GED prep uh, video app for MAP uh, that was just sort of one example of the types of things that we feel can happen Cotted Learning um, as an organization if we work together and think strategically about making things more accessible to learners, making things more accessible to instructors. And as Greg said, it's a very timely thing right now because we see all over the country, people are now realizing that things might not be quote unquote back to normal in the fall. And so folks are having to redesign curriculum and think through how are you going to deliver things in an online format. Um, and we know that's happening state by state. And so uh, this presentation was submitted you know, months ago before COVID, before anything. But it's been something that we've seen over and over again um, where there's sort of duplication of effort. So a big push for crowded learning is to think about ways that we can coordinate our efforts in ways that allow us to collaborate and quote unquote crowdsource, which we'll talk about in this presentation, to create things that just maximize impact. Now on our screen, um, and I'm going to actually do something I've never done before, um, because there is a uh, Wakelet that we've created, which is a very cool tool that I'm going to show you in a second, that has all of the resources that we're going to talk about today, as well as the presentation slides. And so here's a QR code that you can scan. Now, if you don't want to leave the webinar and you're watching on a computer, I'm actually going to show you something because this is a little Zoom tip that I, I want to give as well. So I'm actually going to stop my share and in Zoom, um, you now, if you have a Apple device, have the ability to share your screen. So I'm gonna actually share my phone screen here in a second and it's going to pop up. So I just wanna show people, because I always say, oh, just scan the QR code and people don't necessarily um, know what that means. And so, hold on, I need to do that again. Of course, this I say that I wanna do this and then leave it to, to when I'm doing it live, I literally just showed Greg and Aisa this a second ago and it worked seamlessly. Okay, so there's my um, screen. And so now, as you are working with learners remotely, um, if you have an Apple device, all you have to do uh, is, I'm actually gonna turn my camera on, so we're gonna get a little bit meta here. 
Um, but all you have to do is, and I'm gonna move my zoom icon, when you go to share your screen, normally you'd go to your desktop or the whiteboard or the window that you want. You have this um, iPhone via AirPlay, or you can actually plug it in, and it's going to allow you to show your screen as I'm doing right now. But I also wanna show you, so again, we're getting really meta, right? Um, I want to show you how to scan a QR code. So if you have an Apple device and go to your camera app, so here we are, I'm gonna close out of my camera app. Now I'm gonna open my camera app, and you see it's gonna, it's gonna catch that, um, that QR code, and of course, for some reason, since, again, technology fail. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go to that QR code, and you're gonna see this thing pop up, open Bitly in Safari. Um, oh my gosh. I was holding it to demonstrate, and of course, it, uh, again, technology fail. See, this is why we don't try to do these things live. Okay, one more time. <laughs> Actually, let me close the camera because I think that's part of why um, it's not working. Here we go. Okay, so if I click on that, which will pop up immediately when I use my camera, it's going to open up uh, the Wakelet that we have for this presentation. And Wakelet is a tool that I recommend to lots of people to use because it's a curation tool that allows you to pull resources together in one place. So this is a session wakelet that I've created, which you might do for, say, a lesson. If you want different activities that students are going to be going off into different places, or if you want to type in your own text, um, it allows you to do that. So here's sort of my intro to this wakelet, and then here's the link to the presentation. If you click on that, it will bring you to the presentation. And then it's gonna walk through, as I said, all of the tools that we're gonna talk about today. So we're gonna learn about an initiative called the EdTech Makerspace. And here are examples of the things that we can create through this PD project that's starting in July with Crowded Learning. And here's a recording to a webinar where we explain the EdTech Makerspace as well as that presentation. Uh, then we're also going to be looking at an adult ed video library that we've, we've gone and created using the tool Glide that Greg had mentioned earlier. And you have the ability to share a video, an educational video that you like using with students. So all of these resources that I wanna be pointing out for today's session are all in this wakelet. And so that's why it's a really good tool. So again, if you don't wanna leave a Zoom on your computer, you can use your QR code to scan this or you could type in this URL. Um, I'm gonna ask that hopefully we can share out this information at the um, afterwards, but I'm gonna stop my share from my um, phone now so that we can get back to uh, and launch into the presentation, but I figured I would share um, both how you can mirror your screen on Zoom, sorry about my own technical difficulties, as well as how that QR code works. So today's session, um, first gonna just point out the challenges um, because uh, crowded learning is born out of the idea that we have tons of free and open education resources that are out there. However, they're very underutilized by adult educators. So I'm gonna point out some of the challenges that we've seen since we've been in existence, which was uh, about three years ago now in 2017, and how crowdsourcing is really a way that we can work together to overcome that. Now, when I use the term crowdsourcing, that means picking a topic or a thing to do and having, giving people opportunity to contribute to that. So things like GoFundMe, um, that's crowdsourcing. A lot of people actually know that as the, what they know of crowdsourcing, where it's like, hey, we wanna raise money for this, putting it out there, and then everybody contribute, can contribute. What we're talking about is crowdsourcing ideas, crowdsourcing content, and crowdsourcing um, resources so that we are collectively working together to identify quality resources, to organize those resources in ways that they can be more widely shared out by everybody, as opposed to everybody individually going and doing the same thing, um, as we're seeing out of necessity right now. Um, so we're going to look at ways that we can be using crowdsourcing to locate and find quality content. We're going to see ways that you can, we can use crowdsourcing to share content, and we're going to be looking at ways to crowdsource to create content. 
and you notice that the name of the organization is Crowded Learning. Well, crowd, um, part of that name was because of the belief that crowdsourcing can help us overcome some of those um, challenges. Crowd is also part of the problem. And I'm gonna stop my video so that uh, my little thumbnail isn't in your way. Um, but what we've seen as to barriers uh, in open education uh, resource use is sort of four main areas. And these are all on the slides. These are actually blog posts that we wrote a few years back. Um, overcrowding being the first one. We know there's tons of great content out there and available, but time is of the essence for educators and sifting through all of this content and evaluating it takes too much time. And so we know that that's one barrier as opposed to, hey, I know this textbook has organized chapters. I know that it covers the GED or it covers tape level M. So I'm just going to use that because it has pulled everything together that I need. It might not work for every student, and so I know I need to pull other resources, but at least I have this as a base. And we're not saying to throw that out. We're saying there's ways that we could make it easier to find other resources for those students that that book might not work for. Um, relevance is also uh, an issue. So we, we see that like cable has sort of died in many places because People can find a la carte things and that are available to them through tools like Netflix and Hulu, and they can sort of find the things that they want and only they want. And we feel that that's a problem with open education resources as well. Particularly um, in, in the world of OER, a lot of free resources are developed as entire courses, like OER are very popular at the college level or even K-12. And so it's great that there's a start to finish course that exists on say Canvas or Moodle or edX that anyone could access. But oftentimes um, that course assumes that students are coming in at the same starting point, they're leaving at the same exit point, and they're all gonna be working through that content with some sort of, uh, in some sort of cohort manner, right? Um, and that's just not the nature of adult ed. We know that people are coming in and out at different levels. And so we really need to be able to pinpoint what resources are going to best suit each of our learners um, because of their varying needs. Trust is the third issue, right? So we know that Khan Academy is a widely used resource. I would put that in the level of trust that you might have for say a Paxson resource or a New Reader's Press resource or any of the publisher resources because you know it's very widely used um, in K-12 and adult ed. But some of these other things that are high quality you might just not even know about one of my favorite videos to teach ratios comes from the New Mexico University Digital Learning Games Lab. Now, you probably trust that because it's from a university, but you certainly wouldn't know to go there for it. But then there's also just YouTube videos that people develop that sometimes might do an excellent job at teaching a particular concept, but you don't know who that person is that created that video. And so you're not necessarily inclined to use those types of things or seek those things out. And then the fourth thing that we've seen is sort of a culture. And the culture has been oftentimes, particularly in, in ed tech world, um, we look at educational technology as being the solution in terms of I'm, we're gonna pay to get this product and that's something that we can send our students to and that's all they need. But we always know that they need more. Um, and on the flip side, in the open education space, we don't necessarily recognize the fact that those publisher resources are really high quality. Um, and it's not, it's not the notion that I believe that open education resources will take over and that everyone's just gonna drop the things that they've paid for and move to free resources. It's having the understanding that these things can work together in ways that allow us to make learning more engaging for our learners. And so the efforts that we're going through right now as an organization are to sort of overcome all of those barriers. So the first thing we're gonna look at is crowdsourcing to find quality open content on, um, online. And so the challenge, as I said earlier, is time. And it's the paradox of choice, really. When we have so many choices, it's a little overwhelming. And so we have to ask when we find resources or see things out there, is this resource accurate? Is it current? Is it engaging for learners? 
Uh, is it aligned to the standards or the test objectives that I need to be developing with my learners? And so this is something that is constantly a challenge. And so what crowded learning out of the gate focused on was crowdsourcing by way of talking with teachers. So we put out a number of surveys over the course of our first year. We went to a number of um, conferences and, and different professional development opportunities to ask teachers, what is it that you are using with your students? And as a result of that, we were able to generate a set of 12 what are called skill directories and these are on the crowded learning website that basically uh, are organized by subject areas so 12 different subject areas you'll see there's academic subject areas so covering um, the content areas as well as the skill areas there's workplace competencies and then there's sort of essential competencies or lifetime learn lifelong learning competencies such as digital literacy, financial literacy, health literacy, um, and uh, information literacy, which is becoming increasingly important. But these directories have pulled together the things that we heard from teachers. These are resources that we use with our students. And we're continually organizing and adding to these, but these are all available on our website um, as PDFs, and they're actually also available as Google Docs that you can download. But so that was step one for us and saying, okay, great, now we've, we've narrowed down to some really good websites that we know exist, but teachers still need to sort of go and find within those resources, what are the things that I'm going to use? Take, for example, Khan Academy, which is one of the initial things that Greg and I sort of came together on. The reason that Florida, a few years back, had developed a website of Khan Academy videos specifically uh, aligned, excuse me, to the GED was because Khan Academy, while in those surveys that we did of educators, it's the number one most cited open education resource used by adult educators. We also kept hearing students don't know where to go in Khan Academy because there's no GED course in there. Um, there's no TAVE level M course. And so what we realized is it's great that people know about Khan Academy, but we can basically make Khan Academy more usable to educators and to students if we can narrow it down and start aligning that curriculum to the skills that we know that our adult learners need. And so Crowded Learning has taken that sort of beyond just Khan Academy, but we've looked at a number of free resources, as you can see on the left here, as well as publisher resources that you can see on the right, and we've gathered the college and career readiness alignments for all of these resources. On the right, we've got about 300 publisher resources for which we've gotten alignments. And we've developed a tool called Skill Blocks. And the, the goal of Skill Blocks is to allow you to not have to go here, find fractions, go here, find fractions, go here, find fractions, go here, find fractions, or even in your publisher books, but find fractions adding fractions say in skill blocks and then see which lessons and activities from each of these things align to that very specific skill and then you have as an educator have the ability to add those resources to a skill block that you share with students and we're going to look at this tool in a second and so basically it, it takes going to a bunch of resources and trying to find things in all of those different resources and says you know the skills you need to teach, find the skill and skill block, and then you can see all of these resources that align and you can organize and share it with your learners based on your preferences. So here is an example of a skill block, and this overcomes one of those challenges of finding those open education resources, right? What we've known from the beginning is educators really like publisher resources. They are consistent, they are from trusted providers, and that makes sense. And so if these are books that you use, these are some of the newer books from publishers that align to the table 11 and 12, here they are. You can see the lessons from these two resources that align to this particular skill. But now we've led you also to, hey, here are the Khan Academy practice sets that align to this skill. Here is Math is Fun, which has a number of lessons that focus on this skill as well. And so what that allows you to do is augment your publisher resources with uh, these free and open education resources that oftentimes are more engaging, they're more accessible, 
Um, right now, your students might not even have the books. They only can be accessing the online resources. And so um, these are the ones that we've you know, pulled together. And we've intentionally um, used only mobile-friendly resources in terms of what's in Skillbox for the online resources, because we know that that tends to be the primary mode of access for learners to the internet. So one of the reasons that we also see this type of work as being really important is I've said a couple times now, you know, a publisher resource just might not work for every single student, but a publisher resource, even though it aligns to a particular topic, it might not fully provide coverage. So here's an example of a lesson from one of the newer resources um, focused on geometry, uh, level M. And this is tape level M. It's the same one that I was just showing you that skill block from. And it's on lines, rays, and angles. And the standard asks students to be able to identify these in two-dimensional figures and to draw these in two-dimensional figures as well. So if I look through this two-page lesson, I see it does an excellent job at defining all of the things that are in the standard as points, lines, line segments, rays, perpendicular and parallel lines, uh, acute angles, right angles, and obtuse angles. So it provides definitions for all of those things. It provides examples of all of those things. And then there's practice of all of those things here on the right hand side. But one thing is missing. There's no drawing. Um, students are not asked to draw any of these. Students also aren't identifying um, each of these in two-dimensional figures. Um, they're doing a few of them, but not all of them, because this is a book. You can't have a 500-page book, so there's limited content that can be stuffed in there, right? And so if a teacher uses skill blocks, they can get that lesson here, but then they can pull in all these other resources that provide additional instruction and additional practice. And what you'll see here is the things that I've highlighted from Khan Academy, excuse me. Um, we have identify raised lines and line segments and then draw them. We have identify parallel and particular, perpendicular lines and then draw them. We have identify angle types and then draw them. So they're getting that full coverage and the full depth of coverage that we're required to provide by way of augmenting the publisher resource with um, these free and open education resources. Um, and so one of the things that we've done with Skillbox is designed it to be very flexible. So you may use it as a curriculum reference, and I'm gonna show you Skillbox in a second, where you're just creating Skillbox aligned to things because you wanna see for yourself. Um, you can create skill blocks and share them with students so that they have access to this, this resource set that aligns to a skill they may need. And you could also take individual activities within skill blocks and um, share those with students in the way that you want. And I do have within the presentation um, information on how you can learn more. I actually didn't mean to go here. Let me log out. Um, I'm going to go to Crowded Learning. I'm going to go to Crowded Learning site so that you can see um, how to get to skill blocks and learn more. So up top, it's our sort of second menu item here. It's called Skill Blocks. And this provides information on, um, on what it is, what we're doing. Here's a couple of sample skill blocks. We have a YouTube playlist that has the how-tos of everything you need to do to get started. It's a free resource as well. Everything Crowded Learning does um, is free. And um, this button here allows you to launch. And so when you get to skill blocks, you're going to see basically two things. I'm a student, I'm a teacher. Uh, teachers have to create an account. Again, it's free, but you have to create an account. Students, there are no student accounts right now. The only thing they'd be doing is entering in skill blocks codes that a teacher might have given them. So I'm gonna log in just to show you um, what skill blocks looks like. So this is my account and I've created a number of different ones um, using uh, different different topics. But basically on day one, you wouldn't have anything here, it'd be blank, but you have the ability to add a skill block. And so as I noted, this is organized by the College and Career Readiness Standards. So if, um, if you don't know the sort of parallels, if you're, if you're a TAPE teacher, level A is literacy level, and then these levels are basically level E, level M, level D, level A. I know that's confusing, um, but the college and career readiness standards go from A to E, which goes to literacy level all the way to adult secondary um, in order. So if I go to level C, that's level M, but before I do, 
these are all the domains, right? So all these down here in particular, these are all high school domains um, at level E. But if I click on the particular level of students that I have, you'll see it's only going to have those domains that are relevant for students at that level. Um, and if we stick with geometry, as I was just showing, I click on geometry and we'll see that there's four sort of subdomains within here. One of them is draw um, lines and angles. I can click on that and then I can see that there are 27 activities within skill blocks uh, that align to this particular um, substandard. Now you'll see this is a book. One point, this, you don't get access to the book um, because you've selected it. When you select print materials and skill blocks, you're just saying these are books that we have access to. Um, and so I want to see what lessons from that book align to that skill. Now I can actually bundle multiple standards together into one. So angles gets into um, measurement as well. So if I go to measurement and data, I'm going to see that we do have a geometric measurement standard in here of understanding concepts of angle and measure angles. And so now on the right hand side, we're going to see that there's both the geometry standard as well as the measurement standard. And then I can go through and select activities. Now there's 51 activities that are aligned to these different things. So the job of the teacher in this case, I'm just going to focus on identifying angles is then to select the resources that they want to use. And so um, this lists out everything. You may decide that I don't like Math is Fun, so I'm not going to use anything from Math is Fun. And that's okay, you can select the specific things that you want. I know that I've added this Paxton resource, so I'm gonna select that. I know that I've added this New Reader's Press resource, so I'm gonna add that. I know that I've added, um, these McGraw-Hill resources, but this is the, the more recent of these books that I know of. So I'm going to add that. And you can actually just stop there. So suddenly you're just seeing what, skill by skill from all my publisher resources, which ones align. But now I'm going to go to Khan Academy and just add in um, those lessons that I know align to the skill. One thing to note, if I click on these, it tells me the standard. Um, so I'm just going to select well, I'll select all of them because they all align to the standard so that I know I'm getting that practice. And now I click save, and now I have a skill block and it's in alphabetical order. Um, so then my job becomes to just rearrange these things in the order that makes sense to me, particularly if I'm gonna be sharing these directly with students. So maybe, maybe I pull all my print resources to the top because I know those are sort of the instructional lessons and then I'm going to move through these concepts in the order that makes sense. So um, I might start with identifying lines and line segments um, and then uh, drawing those, etc. I'm not going to rearrange all of this, but now I have this saved skill block and I can enter a name for it here. And now I can share this with students. And so all I need is this code um, and I'm gonna log out and go back to that main screen. And students can enter that code and then they see that skill block. Now, when we're quote unquote back to normal, um, you know, maybe you're in the classroom and you want a hard copy of this. You can print this out for students to so say, Say you design these for different things that you know you teach. You can just have printouts and continually print these or photocopy them for, for students. So now they have a hard copy that walks through all of the resources of the line of that skill. And they have the instructions to go to skill blocks. And then they have the instruction to enter the access code for this particular topic. And they're going to be able to do that on, on any device. Now, again, there's no student account, so it's not tracking any of this but it's helping to sort of bring together all of these resources, which is you know, part of what it is that we're trying to do. Now, um, you may ask, okay, Jeff, you're talking about us crowdsourcing and us doing things. So how do, what does that mean if we're using skill blocks? So um, just one point I wanted to make, again, these are how you might use skill blocks for yourself in terms of either just using it as a reference 
sharing as I just showed you the codes with students so that they have access, or even just picking so you can copy every single one of those things that was listed and you could paste it into Google Classroom or you could paste it into Remind or WhatsApp and share it with students. Um, so that's just you. So what are we talking about when we're saying crowdsourcing? Um, these are the different things that you might share out. Well, this past week, actually, not this week, but last week, this was something I've always sort of said out loud that I want people to do. I didn't know people were actually doing it. So one region in South Carolina, out of the gate, they went to all of our skill blocks trainings in March and April, and they heard me say, have one teacher create skill blocks and then share them with everybody. And then everybody has this curriculum available to them. And so they have a curriculum outline that they started with. And then they had a couple teachers go and look in skill blocks, find the skills that align to their curriculum outline, and then select the resources. And then they created skill blocks so that anyone can access them. And they put it up on a Google site. So what we're looking at now is something that's after Skillblocks came out, and actually this was developed by a retired teacher um, who wanted to continue helping. And so she has created over 200 Skillblocks for teachers in the state of South Carolina using the curriculum alignment that they've created, where it basically lists out these units of study uh, organized within each table level. This is table level E. And if I click on this code, it's going to launch the skill block. And in this case, you see it tells them the print resources and then the Khan Academy resource. So for all of these different um, topics, there's a number of different resources that they've pulled together. So one teacher has created these skill blocks and now any teacher that wants to access these has the ability to do that. And that's what we're talking about when talking about crowdsourcing. Um, so with Skillblocks, it is a tool that if you are a site right now that's trying to figure out how do we design curriculum for if you go back in the fall, you may have a rolling uh, school year or you might have summer off, but um, this is one tool that you could use for math. Right now, Skillblocks only has math, but segment out what you want teachers to be developing and then folks can sort of attack the different topics and areas that they want and then they can um, use it to crowdsource. So I'm gonna pose a question to you, um, and I want you to use the chat. And I, first of all, Issa, are there any questions for me that you've seen? Because I don't see anything in Q&A. Not that I have seen. Um, there was a comment earlier about um, Khan Academy uh, having adult, something called adult link now to where teachers can set up a class and it was announced today. So uh, I'll have to look at that. Teachers have always been able to set up a class um, and I, I maybe they have a, a, like an adult content, but I don't know if they've gone so far as aligning to say Tabe uh, or going and aligning as, as you know, Greg and team uh, at Florida Literacy Coalition did to GED. So um, we do, sorry, Jeff, we do actually have some questions now in the Q&A. Um, Susan says that this is a fabulous tool. Are there plans to expand it beyond math? There are, there are. So um, we're looking uh, for some other, basically partners um, and organizations to work together on this. Uh, again, this is an open tool, um, but it needs to be more than just crowded learning running it. So one of the challenges that we saw out of the gate was we thought we'd do all subjects with TAG, right? And then when we got to reading, it was like main idea and detail. Well. There's not a lot of actual uh, free lessons that go into direct instruction on main idea and detail. There's tons of level readings that are out there. And so we're doing some things that you're actually going to see in a second to get more of those readings into the hands of, of learners and instructors. But math was very easy for us to take that model that you just saw, right? To be able to find resources that specifically align to that one standard and see all the resources. It gets a little challenging with reading because main idea and details, well, any reading, you could be doing and developing main idea and um, details. So finding um, more resources that explicitly get into that direct instruction on those skills and strategies is something that we're working on and figuring out. And actually, speaking of Khan Academy, they have a beta uh, reading program now, um, which actually has some really cool videos. And so I'm excited to see where that goes because that's, you know, that's been one of the missing pieces. 
Great. There are a couple more questions. One more on this subject. Is there a projected timeline for other subject areas? Uh, there is not. Um, and actually, uh, spoiler alert, like we actually might do digital literacy uh, before reading um, because we've been amassing a bunch of digital literacy resources to help folks understand, um, you know, the, the various things around, you know, using different tools, but understanding online safety. Um, and so because we've already compiled that and we've defined a framework for it, we, we might actually, that might be the next thing that we put out. Um, we're also obviously looking specifically for ESL because we know that that is such a wide um, part of, of the adult education population and because those standards are now out, they've been out for a year, we don't have tests yet, but you know, once those tests come, we're going to need those resources aligned. So um, yeah, I, I don't have a timeline, but we are working actively to bring in partners to help us kind of figure that out. Okay. And then I didn't catch this question earlier, but um, this is going back to the subject of screen sharing your mobile device. Um, <laughs> most, most uh, she says, most of my adult students don't have an Apple, but an Android device. Does this Zoom feature work with Android? It doesn't right now. Um, so showing like the how to of like using your phone, um, you know, you, you, like adding it to your home screen. Um, I could point out other tools like the one that we used um, when we were doing the webinar for the GED Map app. But once you're in an app, the experience like in that app, say you're trying to model how to use Wakelet or say you're trying to model how to use um, Quizlet or uh, Padlet. Why does everything end with a lit? That's an interesting thing. I never noticed that. Um, but like the, the experience within the, those apps is, this, is the same. Um, but like the how to download it to your phone, those types of things, I understand that that's different. I would assume that it's not far behind um, that they'll be adding that. But it's, it seems that iOS was the first feature that they added in terms of screen mirroring. Um, so somebody actually answered my question. So um, I can see librarians, especially those interested in adult basic education topics, to get involved. Um, that's a great idea. Um, libra librarians actually, uh, library scientists tend to be very active in the open education community because, um, well, libraries, I mean, that's one of our earliest and oldest institutions that focuses on information and access to information and being free. So that's a really good point. Um, so just think about as, as you see this and maybe hopefully explore the tool, um, what are some ways that we as an organization could be, um, you know, coordinating our teachers' efforts accordingly so that everyone um, is benefiting and, and not duplicating efforts. So now we're going to focus on crowdsourcing to curate content. Um, and so curation is the process of actually, you know, we've, so actually stepping back, the reason that skill blocks is so easy to use, it was so quote unquote easy to build is because we took these larger sets of resources, right? Khan Academy, CK12, these are established libraries of resources. Um, and so they all provided their alignment, their alignments to the standards were there. So all we needed was to pull those together. And so now we know that we have all of the alignments of all the Khan Academy resources, all of the alignments of those books, all of the alignments of the um, other free resources that are in there. But what about like those one-off videos or things that as I was saying earlier, might be really effective and teachers might be using. It might be their go-to video for teaching equivalent fractions, but it's not necessarily from a big site like Khan Academy. So how can we start curating those and having people make those suggestions so that within something like skill blocks, we can be adding those in as well so that you're getting some of these more unique sources. And so one of the things that um, that involves is trust, right? So um, we need to be able to trust these resources. We know there's lots of good um, lessons, activities, games, and videos that are um, out there, but they're from a variety of sources. And so people do ask, is this a trusted source? Who else is using this? And is it effective for our students? And so an activity that we did um, in January uh, of this year was an experiment of sorts to crowdsource a video library. And we used a tool called Glide. Now Glide is the, um, 
is the tool that we ultimately ended up working with the Florida Literacy Coalition to build the GED app. But what we did was we put out a form uh, that asked teachers, and it's still a live form, and if anyone wants to, if you're bored with hearing me talk, and go into the Wakelet and fill out that form if you have a video that you like, go ahead and do it um, right now. But this form asked teachers to find a pick a video that's on YouTube that you've used with students that you like. It could be a Khan Academy video. It could be a math antics video. It could be uh, something from some of these other, like more out there, like, um, like math snacks. There's others, there's ESL videos. I've learned about a bunch of great ESL video sources because of this activity. And so basically we ask people share a video, say what subject area it is and tell us the topic. Um, so that we could basically build an app with it. And so what that resulted in was, um, and here it is, I guess I didn't put these in the right order, adult education video library. So here's that form where people submit a video. And if you've used Google Forms, the result of a Google Form is a Google Sheet that actually captures all of that information. And so we created a uh, video library that pulled from the um, form that folks had created. So I should have actually had this open. But this is an app that allows me as a user to, um, and this was bad planning on my part, I need to open up my Gmail. Um, but you should see this process anyway, because this is the process that um, we are going to need to use for the GED math app that I'm going to show you. So uh, I, I give my email and it gives me a pin 21639. So let me go back to here, 21639. I guess I could have mirrored my phone as well, but seeing how well that went earlier, <laughs> yay technology. So this is the app um, and you can actually add this app to your phone as well. Actually, here's a QR code that would allow you to add it to your phone. So. Uh, this was our video submission app, and the result of teacher crowdsourcing was if you click on any of these subjects, we have videos that align. So remember I said ESL, I had never heard of any of these um, uh, in, in here, but teachers submitted these. And so now what's nice about this for crowded learning in particular is we're learning about sources like Envid and Jennifer ESL, and those are both uh, libraries of video content around ESL. And so one of our projects that we are definitely thinking of, and we've been talking with a few organizations, is to build an adult ESL video library. We're just trying to figure out how we organize that content uh, in meaningful ways. But this app, basically teachers submitted information. So if we go to this one on food vocabulary, um, the person in filling out the form, they said the topic is food vocabulary, they gave the URL, they indicated the subject was ESL, they told us the source, and so now, and they tagged it so that we have all of um, this, and so now, um, you know, it's basically in this library of videos that we can continue to expand, and it, this is sort of always open to folks, uh, again, it's in the Wakelet, so if you want to recommend a video, go ahead and do it because it'll it just automatically gets added. Um, but one of the things that's nice about this is, you know, we can see all all of the different videos in here. We can search by topic. So, or I, if I know that I like math antics, um, I can do that, and I'm going to see all of the videos that are from math antics, which there's a lot of them, obviously. So just kind of a, this was an interesting experiment that we ran to see, well, how can we get people to submit videos um, and, and to collectively work together on this project. It was also to promote that tool, Glide, um, which is how we developed that app, to adult educators. Uh, it did not go well. <laughs> Um, so we found that it was a challenge to get people to submit. Now, we could do prizes, we could do, um, we did midstream uh, say, hey, you could win a $25 Starbucks gift card. Um, all you have to do is submit a video. We still only got about like 70 submissions, which is great, but uh, it was hardly the level of participation that we were hoping for. Um, and so this is one of the challenges of crowdsourcing. 
Um, but it did give us experience with a new mobile friendly delivery tool, which is Glide. And again, that what I just showed you, um, we can continuously build this and add to it. Um, we just need to figure out ways to get spurts of participation from educators um, so that they can share things. One of the nice things though is like all those math antics videos were in there because well, we knew math antics existed. But say with Jennifer ESL, now that we know that that's a site that folks use, we can go to her channel and we can just add, you know, all of the videos in there so they're all in one place. And again, we're going to want to organize it a little bit more specifically to skills. Um, but what we realized as part of this project is with that tool Glide, if we work with other organizations who might already have content organized in a, in a clean way, um, that we could work with them to scale the impact of that work and make it more accessible to learners. And so um, we partnered with the Florida Literacy Coalition. We started this in about, I think, January or February uh, in anticipation of the, the um, the uh, conference here had no idea that there would oh, be a pandemic that would happen. And so the need for this tool became even more pressing. And so if you're aware, Florida Literacy Coalition had this website of um, content. These are all Khan Academy videos aligned to the topics of the GED. Um, that's been around for a few years. It's very widely used. Uh, and you can access this on a mobile device, but you, you know, you're navigating a website on a mobile device that isn't necessarily designed to be um, you know, mobile. So by basically taking all of the lists of content that they had done to create this, we were able to put it into app format. Um, and so we launched this app on May 27th. Um, and right now we have like 600 plus users. And there's been a total of over 25,000 sessions within the app. Um, and that, that is just, that's showing that if we sort of coordinate efforts around crowdsourcing and work together and share out things that we know are gonna be used by people, that we really can scale the impact of some of this work. Um, so you can go to the Florida Literacy Coalition website into the GED section to learn more about this app. It functions very similarly to what I just showed you but learners have the ability to navigate by these topics, go to these subtopics within, and then see listings of video that align to it. What's nice about it is we've also added the Khan Academy link, so they could watch the video in the app, like you see here, or they can launch it in Khan Academy. Um, I didn't mean to do that because I'm gonna have to log in again. I'm not going to spend time logging in because I wanna make sure that I finish. Oh, it's actually loading uh, and not making me log in, cool. So I'll show you real quickly what the app looks like. Um, here are all of the topics. And what we've built into it is, again, the ability for folks to search on the Florida Literacy Coalition. There's a quiz. So we've added that quiz in here. Um, and this would launch the quiz in Google Forms. Um, I'm going to go back and back. I don't know why the back button's not showing up on the screen here. I think it's because I'm zoomed out. But if I go to any of these topics like basic algebra, you'll see there's a lot of topics in here. Um, and then if I go in, what I see is the video. Um, I could launch it in Khan Academy. And that might be important because I want to log into Khan Academy and track that work in Khan Academy. So this will allow you to do that. But within the app, I have the ability to, this is evaluate an algebraic expression to track my work and I can click this as a student. This is for learner sort of self-guided learning. I can mark it as complete. I can add the date um, and that will go in there. This is actually something new. Oops, I didn't mean to launch the video. But now I've listed the date and, and that I've completed it. I can add a note if I want to that says, um, says whatever I want if I could type. Um, and that learner just basically has access to an entire library of videos aligned to the GED to help them with their GED prep. Um, and so, you know, this could be expanded down the road. We could pull in videos that aren't from Khan Academy, right? Um, as long as we know what aligns, uh, we have the ability to do that, right? So we've got the starting point and if we can just, you know, coordinate efforts around whatever skills we want to be developing, we can be pulling these things together and actually getting them out into students' hands in mobile-friendly format. So I think that's the really cool thing about this project. 
Um, we've also been working with a site in Kentucky that did a very similar thing. So they've, uh, they wanted more mobile friendly content for learners. Uh, and so they tasked their teachers with finding videos that align to the GED Ready test report. So not just math, but all subject areas. And so they had compiled this into this spreadsheet. And this, I met this teacher actually on a totally different project where she was doing this training that we were running and she was talking about this project. And I'm like, that's really cool. So what are you gonna do next? You have this amazing spreadsheet. She says, I don't know. <laughs> and so we said, well, what if we put it into an app? And so now using that same tool, they've created a GED Greatest Hits video playlist um, that allows students to browse by topic and basically take their GED Ready test report, find the skills that they're partially ready or not ready for, and go to videos that align to that topic. And so again, we know teachers are doing this type of curation all over. What are ways that we can coordinate it so that we can be pulling it together in such a way? Arizona is doing the same thing, but they're actually building it in as part of PD. So teachers go through four hours of professional development um, where it's how to take resources and make sure that they align to standards. But they're actually organizing it. They're saying what the platform is. They're saying um, what the context is, like where does it fall within a lesson? And they're doing this actually because they wanna be able to track time and say that if a learner completed this lesson in Khan Academy, that that counts for 30 minutes or a half an hour of proxy distance learning time because they allow for teachers to um, count seat time through proxy hours so long as the resource has been verified as taking X amount of time. It's called the teacher verification model. So they're crowdsourcing the process of identifying content that's freely available so that they can document those hours so that then they now have this spreadsheet of resources that everyone can access and teachers can assign these things and know that if a student has completed any of these, that they have the proxy hours. So there's all sorts of curation that's happening. Um, and we also really like this work because while those apps, like that GED Greatest Hits app, is not going to, learners will be able to track what they do in it, teachers aren't getting necessarily any reporting. So we're actually going to be experimenting with them um, we're building in a student feedback form for all of those resources. And so students will be able to get credit for finishing a resource, but they have to submit a form. So we've created a Google form that they can indicate, uh, I completed this resource. So there's a copy link for everything so that they can paste that URL into the form so we know what video they did. They have to provide a couple sentence summary of what they learned. And then they have to say whether like how effective they felt the resource was as well as how long it took them. And so with all of these things in place, we're teaching learners the process of actually, we want their input on, is this a good resource? Because just because a teacher found it doesn't mean that it's effective for the student. And so if 10 students do that resource and nine of them say, this video is terrible, then the teacher, then Kentucky knows we probably should find another video because students don't find it helpful or engaging. Um, this also helps students sort of develop time management skills and lifelong learning skills. And so what I'm showing here, just as this doesn't need to be crowdsourcing per se, but this is work that's happening in New Hampshire right now. They do weekly goal setting for students and they uh, allow students to pick apps based on a, a selection of apps that are learning apps that they could use. Um, and learners set weekly goals, they track their time, and then they, again, provide these details. Now this is a printout format, but we're sort of taking that and trying to do it digitally so we can build it into tools like Skillblocks or build it into tools like these apps that we've been uh, partnering with organizations to build so that teachers are not only able to get some feedback on the work that students are doing, but students are actually being part of the process of curation, which we think is really important. So I'm gonna stop for questions, but I'm gonna also pose a question to you. In what ways do you think that your organization or, or Florida could work to crowdsource the curation of content around the skills and concepts that learners need for success? So interested in hearing your ideas, um, but also, 
uh, any other feedback. So I'm going to answer questions while we do that. Within the video library, do you include YouTube uh, or other videos that have advertising? Uh, if it's on YouTube, it, it can be put in there. Um, one of the things that's really cool about that Glide, the app that we app building tool that we've been using, is normally when you click on a YouTube video, like there's the ad at the start, and you know three seconds in, it'll have a button that says skip ad. Somehow, I don't know how they do it, but within that Glide app, if you start the video, you never see an advertisement. There's no ads. And when you get to the end, it doesn't like kick you into the next video like you would if you were in YouTube. So it's kind of, I don't know if it's magic or if there's something that they've done, um, but it's, it's very cool. So can this tool interface with the Canvas learning management system? Um, it, you probably technically could connect to say quizzes that are in there, but the learner would have to have a login on Canvas and have the app on their phone um, because then it would, I presume, automatically log them into Canvas. So you could put in links into the things that you build in if you wanted to direct them specifically to something in Canvas, which is actually a really interesting um, point that I've never thought of. But if you knew where you wanted students to go in Canvas, you could actually build something out in Glide and have direct links to those specific things. Um, yes, the head does spin with Glide app because it's a super cool thing. Um, do these tools correlate with CASAS exam? Um, and are you still using the future test, future workbooks, future test prep manual? I don't know what the future texts are. Um, in terms of correlating with CASAS for ABE and ASE, yes. Um, it does in the sense that it's the college and career readiness standards. So one of the things that um, we intend to do in skill blocks, and I should have pointed this out, uh, let me go back to my teacher account, um, is right now the way that content is organized, if I go to add skill blocks, is those domains. You'll see this is a pull down, but there's nothing there. We want to add in TABE and CASAS and GED so that um, you can sort of add that layer of filtering in here. Uh, what we need are the crosswalks of those tests. So TABE, uh, TABE sort of disappeared. <laughs> um, we have the content, but we need to know that it's final. And once we have that, we'll be able to actually pull this down and do a TABE filter. Um, so you'll see LEMDA, it'll pull out the standards that aren't on the tape test. It will also um, you know, allow you to, to, to specifically be finding the tape skills and sub skills. Uh, we want to do that with CASAS, but their alignments are a little uh, ambiguous, I guess, in terms of how they align to the standards, because all of this content is specifically aligned to the college and career readiness standards. Um, so as long as we can crosswalk and know that these standards align to this CASA skill or these standards align to this GED skill, we can add in that filter. Um, we just have not done that yet because we really are in, in beta form um, for this tool. But if you know your standards alignments to those tests, um, you have the ability to find them. Let me go back to the chat. Yeah, so I'm actually going to play around with that. I have I don't really use Canvas, but I do um, I do play around with it because I want to see kind of how things work. So what I want to see is if um, if you can uh, direct link into specific places in Canvas because then um, you could use Glide as a as a guide into the specific things that you want, um, which would be kind of nice actually. I can imagine because navigating LMSs can sometimes be a little hairy. Um, but that's, those are good questions. Um, I'm still learning Glide, but we, and, and Greg and I used to witness uh, that learning <laughs> as we were building it together. Some of the features that are in that GED math app for Florida Literacy Coalition were the result of us sort of racking our brains over what should we have in here. Okay, now how do we do that in this app building tool? So there's a ton of features that we still haven't even um, unearthed, but we're, we're just getting started, but it's definitely got a lot of potential. I guess I do see something in the Q&A, let me. Yeah, this was going back to the feedback form. 
is there also a way for educators to provide feedback on a resource? The learner feedback is good, but it could also be skewed. Um, I mean, in that case, those are teachers that have, uh, it's their teachers that have pulled those together. So um, they should be looking collectively at that student feedback. Um, but then it really depends on the curation process, right? So in that case, I've even seen some videos in that Kentucky group that I'm like, oh, this isn't that great of a video. Um, so one of the things that as we've developed, uh, excuse me, skill blocks, as we're doing these things like learner, learner evaluation of resources and looking at things like Arizona where they've really formalized that curation process is really trying to nail down what, what is an effective and accessible way for curation um, so that it's not like we're spending eight hours curating a resource to say, okay, this gets the thumb up, but that we're putting in safeguards that say, okay, because it made it into the app, we know that a couple teachers have signed off on it. And then we're also going to continuously be gathering student feedback to see that, okay, um, you know, is this effective or is this not? And it's, it's very experimental right now what we're doing, but eventually like a, a a vision that we have for skill blocks is that there is a, a more student guided version of it where students can look for skills and find resources and um, you know the teacher might not doesn't have to assign those things but we, we need to figure out if we have 20 resources that align to that skill which ones should be the ones that are served up to the student and if we're seeing that a lot of students are saying I don't like this video then yes it could be skewed however um, it also, you know, if, if, um, if three people say you look sick, then maybe you should sit down for a second. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the power of the crowd as well. I mean, we, we pick recipes based on the number of five stars that it's gotten. And if 100 people have given it, you know, it has a 4.7 4 rating uh, and a different recipe for the same, for the same dish, uh, two people have rated it and has five stars you're going to go with 100 people because you know it's not just the person who posted the recipe and their friend who rated it but a lot of people have said this is highly related uh yes we are we're trying to get tabe to finally provide those um but again tabe if you're familiar with their um if you're familiar with their uh blueprints um their blueprints basically and their test report is organized um, by these domains so like literally, um, these are the nine things that are, or is it 10, nine things that are on level M math. Um, it's the exact same domains that you're gonna see on a student score report. So you, you, it is, it's nicely aligned to TABE because TABE is so aligned to the college and career readiness standards. Um, we're just waiting for their official wording because what we want to do is to be able to just like that GED app, we want these to basically say the things that you see on the TABE test report um, so that it's making that connection. This student is partially proficient in this TABE skill. Here are the resources. Um, we're just waiting on them. And as I'm, I've said this now four times, uh, it makes me realize I need to uh, get on them again because um, we just, we're just waiting for them to send it to us. And it may have dropped off because I understand that they're busy. So finally, the last piece is we're going to look at crowdsourcing to uh, create content. And this is actually something that I'm excited about because it's the first time we've done it. And you are all invited to be part of uh, this little inaugural launch of something that Crowded Learning is doing. Um, so one of the challenges that we have with open education resources is consistency. Um, we know that there's resources that are out there. Um, we know they might even be aligned, but okay, this is a lesson that this teacher created and they have this lesson plan format. And in order for me even to know what this lesson's about, I've got to read through all this content and see like, what are the objectives? What are the materials that they're using in this? And that becomes very challenging. Um, and a lot of teachers, even if they post things and make them freely available to others, they don't necessarily design them in a way with a mindset of thinking, well, could another teacher pick this up and, and work with it right out of the gate? Or are they going to have to do a bunch of modifications to it before they can even use it? And so we do have this, this nature of sharing, which is great, especially in adult education, but sometimes just because it's been made available to me, doesn't mean that it's very usable to me because it was designed by a teacher based on how he or she teaches and it doesn't necessarily work for me. So here's a, like, this is OER Commons. 
and we see there's three different um, sources here. Connie Rivera is an amazing math educator. I was like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this because I know Connie. She's actually the executive director or president of the Adult Numeracy Network. So I know this lesson's good, but I'm gonna dive in and figure out like what's going on. And then here are two that actually evidently Pearson is now posting some open education resources. But each of these lessons is designed differently. And so teachers have to read it to actually even get it. And like, what does it look like? And so how is it delivered? What is the format and what materials are needed, as I just said earlier? Um, and so we're pulling together a crowdsourcing experiment called the EdTech Makerspace that starts next month. And if you're interested in that wakelet is a sign up form. And the notion of the EdTech Makerspace is for teachers, now that we know that this, this sort of virtual learning, distance learning is not just a temporary thing, it's gonna be a little longer. And hopefully you're actually learning to use tools that even if, even if tomorrow we were gonna be back face to face, you'd still use some of these tech tools because they're really effective. And, and learners actually can engage in different ways outside of the classroom. And so the, nature, the notion of the EdTech Makerspace is where we focus on a few select tools and we teach teachers how to use those tools effectively. So Quizlet, Google Forms, Wakelet, others, um, those are tools that we know teachers are using. So how do we um, you know, provide training for teachers? And so we're gonna provide training for those tools. And rather than just being an hour and you're done, great, you know how to use a tool, you may or may not go and use it, we're gonna give opportunities to practice and apply using a openly licensed content resource that we know is widely used. It's, it's called Reading Skills for Today's Adults. And it's an open level library. And in the process, as you practice learning and, and practicing building Quizlets and practicing building Google Forms quizzes, you're going to be building vocabulary decks and uh, comprehension quizzes for the stories within that library. And so the result will be this library that is really good to begin with and a lot of educators use, but with these added engaging resources that enhance it. So the library that we're gonna be using is a tool, as a website called Reading Skills for Today's Adults. There's 348 readings within the library and there's audio recordings on the website at different speeds that model different parts of fluency. And the nice thing is these are early levels. So these are Lexile at the lower end of the spectrum. We always hear from educators, there's not enough level readings for um, early level readers. Here's 348 of them and they're designed for adults. So they focus on topics like money and food and health and parenting and education and safety. Um, and so, Again, this library is great, it's online. Um, it's not very mobile friendly uh, in terms of navigation, but the stories uh, read fine on a phone. But each of these stories, they built an activity supplement that has vocabulary activities and grammar activities and speaking and comprehension activities. And there's something else there that I realized went beyond the slide. As I said, all of these readings are at early levels. So if you're a TAB person, this is levels E, M, and D. Um, and it's at those Lexile levels. So it's giving us a lot of content. Now, many of you may have already heard of Reading Skills for Today's Adults. It's been around for over 10 years, but if you Google Reading Skills for Today's Adults, you're gonna get the old site. I, I keep telling them you need to take this down because teachers are getting here and seeing, okay, it's good, but it's not the enhanced site that they have. Um, this is the, the new URL, Reading Skills for Today. Um, but what these readings look like is there's an online reading, and I, because of time, we're not gonna dive into the website, but for the reading, it has a supplement. And the supplement has vocabulary activities, a vocabulary closed paragraph, a fill in the blank activity. It has a language activity. In this case, it's common contractions that were used in the story. And then a writing activity that has students um, using those cont uh, contractions and sentences. Then there's a speaking activity with sentence stems to help them sort of with the phrasing of their response that's, that deals with comprehension. Then there's your standard multiple choice comprehension assessment. And then there's a writing activity. So 348 readings, all of them have audio recordings to model fluency and all of them have this supplement um, to have all this practice. But right now, if you're working remotely, this is a downloadable Word document. Your students might not be able to do that. Um, and even if they could, 
Uh, they can't do anything with it unless they have Word um, on their phone. Um, and so typically, like the use case that they designed this for was, okay, we're dealing with schools and, and students being in school, teachers would print these things out and hand them to students. Well, since we are all remote right now and we all want to be engaging learners with content, they can perfectly well go to the website, but what if we took these vocabulary act, uh, words and designed, I didn't mean to click that, I always put links in my slide and that gets a little dangerous. Um, and, and took that and designed Quizlet activity sets so that learners have the ability to engage with this vocabulary in multiple formats. Um, the correct website was reading skills, the number four today.com. And I think it's in linked in the wakelet, um, but um, I can, we'll post that in a second. So, now, instead of having to download this to get the vocabulary, we've got a Quizlet set that, that um, students can engage. It's mo super mobile friendly. It's got audio of all the words. They can do matching games. They can test themselves, um, or they can just simply use flashcards. And then if we have this comprehension assessment at the end with these five multiple choice questions, if we train teachers on how to use Google Forms, teachers can be um, using Google Forms to build assessments using these comprehension questions that anyone can use. So again, mobile friendly, and we'll be setting those quizzes so that students uh, you know, get feedback right away. And teachers will learn how to weight each of the items, how to create different uh, levels of sharing of Google Forms so that they can share things. Um, we're doing this with openly licensed content. So we're gonna be teaching teachers how to make sure that you're um, using that license appropriately and citing it. So you're going to be learning all of these new skills, how to use Quizlet and then creating Quizlets, how to use Google Forms, and then creating Google Forms using content from these uh, supplements. And so suddenly, for each one of these stories, not only will there be the original story, but there'll also be a vocabulary deck and a Google Form quiz that are all mobile friendly. But how will people find these? Okay, so there's a Quizlet, there's, a, there's the story, and then there's the Google Form. The last tool we're gonna teach uh, teachers how to use is Wakelet. So we're going to be creating Wakelets of these stories so that we can, it's the same thing that I showed you at the start where all of the resources that I'm using in this webinar right now are in that Wakelet. And so we can pull the Quizlet, the story, and the comprehension quiz from Google Forms into this Wakelet and so we will ultimately have a Wakelet library of resources that has all of those Quizlets. And what's cool about Wakelet is you have the ability to share a Wakelet with, through Google Classroom, through Microsoft Teams, through Remind, through Facebook, or you can copy paste that and text it out to students um, with whatever tools you use, maybe like uh, WhatsApp. And so the result of this will be all of these stories in Wakelets that basically pull together um, every, all the content that teachers have created. So we're basically, it's a collective crowdsourcing experiment, if you will, where you're getting training on how to use these tools and then pulling these resources into a Wakelet so that we have a library of mobile-friendly Wakelets um, that have the story, have the vocabulary practice, have the Google Forms. So it's sort of PD with purpose, if you will. Um, so as I said, that uh, that is something that's starting in July, mid-July, and we'll do two-week sprints with each of the tools where you'll learn uh, how to use the tool, and then basically you will pick the stories that you want to create Quizlets uh, and Google Forms and Wakelets for, and we'll be developing those together. So how can you contribute and be part of the process? Well, one, I just said that at Tech Makerspace, that's the last thing here, but that's, um, that's our first big push of trying to, to really push on crowdsourcing with teachers. Um, but we also have in our website the ability for you to just suggest resources. So we've always had this uh, a form on our crowded learning website where teachers submit, hey, this is a great thing for reading or social studies or science. Um, if you're interested in using skill blocks, obviously right now you only uh, could do that with math. So if you're a math teacher, um, go ahead and start playing with skill blocks. And as I showed you with South Carolina, you can build skill blocks and you can be sharing them with other teachers. 
Um, you have the link in your wakelet. You also have the link to the building and the skill blocks, but you have the link in the wakelet for submitting videos. So um, we're just kind of casually amassing videos, but again, one of the things that's probably in the very near future is doing an ESL video library. Um, but we're definitely um, interested in continuously gathering videos because we know that's obviously very engaging content, very mobile family member students. And with that Glide app, it's really easy for us to organize those and, and provide those to students in different ways. And then finally, the EdTech Makerspace um, is a great opportunity. Just some other resources to point out on the Crowded Learning website. We have a teacher tools page, and these are all linked. Um, that provides you with a nice list of tools that we know that adult educators are using, organized by communication tools and texting tools, uh, course platform tools, supplemental learning content, um, sharing tools, quizzing tools, uh, and then an implementation plan template that allows you to basically think through the logistics of what you've been experiencing for the past few months and basically to help you make some decisions in terms of what tools do I wanna to continue to use with learners, given that this is not just a Band-Aid fix right now, but it's probably gonna be a little bit ongoing for us. Um, some strategic thinking around which tools might I use for instructional content, for the delivery of that content in the organization and for communication um, with my students. So I will end with questions. Uh, we are right at the um, mark. Aisa, have you seen any come in? Not at the moment. We'll give everyone a few minutes to come up with any questions. We are pretty much at the wrapping up point. Oh, I will get what I promised um, that one educator earlier. Here is the um, URL for reading skills for today's yeah. adults. Um, and I'll also here just pop in the wakelet for this session. So again, everything that was pointed out in here uh, is in this wakelet. This is why I uh, love uh, wakelet because it allows me to just push out everything in one, one place. So the slides, um, information about skill blocks, about the EdTech makerspace, about the video library, about the Florida, um, the GED app that was developed with Florida Literacy Coalition, all of those things are uh, linked in this um, wakelet, so. It looks like we do have one question from Jean. How do I register for the project? So uh, if you go to the Crowded Learning website, um, and it's, it's linked again in the wakelet, but uh, in the wakelet, if you click on the EdTech Makerspace, it's gonna bring you here. Um, you can see the launch webinar that we did. We have not started. This was just information about like how it works. So a little bit more relaxed than what I just went through, um, walking through the content, the purpose of doing it, and what the end result will be. Um, but here's a link here to join the summer cohort. Um, uh, there's actually also the slide deck that we used for that presentation and, and then the stories. Um, here are links to all of the stories. We actually did a test run of this with teachers in Chicago to see how it would go. Um, and so all of these were also created by teachers um, and, and, and using Quizlet, using forms. Uh, they did not learn Wakelet. I pulled together the Wakelets in this case. But for the EdTech Makerspace summer cohort, you're going to be learning how to, how to create these as well. So you'll have a bunch of new tools in your teaching arsenal. And you'll be doing work that everyone benefits from. Well, great. I am not seeing any more questions. So we can go ahead and wrap this up. Um, thank you everyone again for joining us. I have posted the link to the presentation in the chat and I will be actually adding them, adding the link to the discussion forum as well on the conference portal. Um, this session was recorded and it will be available on the conference portal as well. Please don't forget to fill out the survey that pops up after the session. Your feedback is very important to us and we hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming and uh, go forth and share.